Ecclesiastes chapter 4, beginning in verse 9. When you have it, say results. Okay. Here it is. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Say results. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? It's as though one may be overpowered by another. How many know two can withstand him? And it says, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Thank you, Matthew. This morning, I want to take a moment to talk to you on a subject entitled Created for Results. Put your hand to your heart and say, I have been created for good results. For good results. The two greatest days of a person's life is the day they were born again. How many are, are, were grateful when you were born again? The two greatest days of a person's life is the day they were born again and the day they discover why. The day, the day they discover why. Now, God saves us and he rescues us, but then what he does is he gives us something powerful to do. I want you to touch that good smelling, good looking neighbor and tell him there's something powerful for you to do. Let me prove it. When God created Adam, he gave him two things. He gave him a task and he gave him a helpmate. When he created Adam, he gave him a task and he gave him a helpmate. Because it's always been in God's perfect will and in his plan to make us fruitful and to also multiply ourselves. That's the reason he created us. He told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. And so it's always been God's plan for us to be fruitful or to be effective at what he's called us to do and to multiply ourselves. Another way to put it is it's always been God's plan for us to leave a legacy. I mean, that's a word we use in Victor. Somebody say legacy. There's a legacy inside of every single one of us that needs to be released. There's a legacy. Legacy lives in us. Legacy lives in our families and legacy lives in the ministry. And here's what I want to share with you this morning when it's all said and done. How many know there will come a day when it's all said and done? When it's all said and done, you and I will be remembered for who we were and what we did. That'll sober you up. That'll make you put the bottle down. That'll make you put the weed down. That'll make you put the pills down. Because when it's all said and done, we will be remembered for who we were and what we did, that's heavy, because God's called us to multiply and build a legacy. That's why our decisions are so very important. See, every person in this world is born looking like their parents, but they die looking like their decisions. <laughs> every, every person must make a decision, purpose, vision, legacy. Miles Monroe, the great pastor, said there is something for you to start that is destined for you to complete, to finish. And I want to share this with every one of the members of our church this morning. Some of you might be new. I pray you make this your church. If not, it's cool. But I want to talk to the members this morning. And I want to tell you something. There's no greater joy in a person's life than to finish something. There's no greater joy in a person's life than to finish something. We have a lot of starters. We don't have a lot of finishers. And I want you to know that, that finishing things brings joy. I, I get so excited when I'm working on my house. Have you ever worked on your house or worked on your car? And I get so excited when I find a room that I need to repair in my house. Or the other day I repaired the speakers in my house. They weren't working and I had to get the speakers working. And, and I repaired the speakers. I went out, bought some equipment, and repaired the speakers, man. And, and for two hours after I finished repairing the speakers, I, I blasted those speakers full blast. <laughs> because it wasn't the music that gave me a buzz. It was the fact that I finished the product that gave me the buzz. The project that gave me the buzz. Come on, somebody. 
Ladies, you know what I'm talking about. You know, you, you, you fix up your bedroom and now you want to just hang out in your bedroom. Because it feels good to finish. Touch your neighbor, tell them it feels good to finish. You wash your car, you clean your rims. What do you want to do? You want to cruise up and down Highland? No, talk to me, somebody. Your car ain't even that nice, but you still want to cruise. Because finishing feels good. It is a medical fact. Hear me and hear me clear. It is a proven medical fact that when a human being completes a task, dopamine is released in their body. Our body is filled with certain chemicals. And every person has dopamine in their body. And when a person completes a task and does a task well, a little bit of dope. <laughs> See, I knew I'd get your attention this morning. A little bit of dope begins to fill them up and they get a little bit of a buzz because the body was built to complete things. Come on, talk to me now. That's why when Sister Julie came with that thing some years ago, addicted to the cause. It was a year where a lot of people in Victory Heights were feeling good, man, because they know that God has given us a cause and given us a task, and it feels good to do what God has called us to do. Come on and shout on it and thank him for a purpose. <laughs> Terry and it feels good to finish. And, and what you will find is that a person who's constantly sad has a, has a trail of unfinished projects. There's a depression spirit on them, and they're always sad or always in a negative mode. Negative spirit. It's funny how people have a way of criticizing people that are doing things. People often are critical of things that they cannot accomplish themselves. And so here's what I want to tell you. Instead of being a hater, start partnering with the finishers and learn how to finish the task. That don't, you don't got to be a critic. Can I just park right here for a minute? You don't got to be a critic. You don't got to talk bad about people. You don't say, well, look, you know, well, this and that and all. Well, they got help. That, you better believe it. None of us gets here by ourselves. We've learned to partner with other finishers, and that's why the Lord is blessing his people. Come on and shout in this place, because God has called you to do something significant. See, we've been called to work with a purpose, and when we finish a task, we get high, on the most high. So how many know we were created, but we were also created to have great results? That's what I want to teach you how to do this morning. Is that all right? How many say, I want great results, Pastor? I want better results. I want to see greater things. I want to do something with my life. Okay, clap for the Lord so I know you want this message. All right. I like you guys. You guys are doing good this morning. Number one. You want results, write this down. Number one, results require time and investment. Results require time and investment. Vision requires time because any vision worth having takes time. Any, any vision worth having takes time. The question is, do you want to be a mushroom or an oak tree? Now, a mushroom will grow in six days. But how many know a mushroom doesn't live very long? Anything that can grow overnight can die overnight. A marriage that can happen overnight, you better believe it could die overnight. A relationship that just springs up out of nowhere doesn't have much hope. Talk to me, somebody. Now, I don't know about you. I don't want to be a mushroom. I want to be an oak tree. And a mushroom will grow in six days, but it'll take 60 years to grow an oak tree. And how many know an oak tree is one of the strongest trees in the forest? So vision takes time. Touch your neighbor, tell them vision takes time. My question is, what are you working on? What are you working on this year? What are you working on right now? Oh, pastor, I'm still working this year on something I was working on last year. And you know what I want to say to you? Good. Good. Because some of you are still working on something this year that you were working on in 2017. But I want to tell you something. If you're still working on something that you were working on last year, don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged because that means God must have given you a big vision. 
That must mean that God gave you a big promise. Come on, somebody. And too many people give up on the vision that God has given them. And that's why we don't get anything done. And what do we need is we need a people who are going to get a vision from God that recognize that true growth and true victory doesn't happen overnight. Don't get discouraged. True visionaries understand you never reap in the same season in which you sow. There's a season to sow and then there's a season to reap. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, he said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. That, that's, that's something you got to get a hold of. Are there any visionaries out there? You, you got to get a hold of that. There's a season for planting. There's a season of watering. And then there's a season of increase. See, God will always increase you according to what you can handle. What are you working on? What do you have right now? What are you holding right now? What's in your bank account right now? What, 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 what do you got going on? Somebody's like, I ain't got nothing going on. Come on, look at me. You got something going on? You got, oh, we all got something going on. What, what, <laughs> what do you got going on? Well, let me tell you, you have what you can handle. Don't be discouraged if you don't have what your neighbor has. Don't be discouraged if you don't have what Pastor Al has. Don't be discouraged if you don't have what Sister Georgina has. Don't, don't be discouraged if you don't have what your leader has because you have what you, ha you can handle. But here's the good news, and here's what you got to think. What are you doing with what you have? Because what you have, God has put in your hand for a purpose. I was thinking about all the things that God has taken out of my life. How many said, man, last year God took some stuff out of my life? Took some people out of my life. Thank you, Jesus. Hold on. That's not the point. But what I'm just doing is just rejoicing. Because sometimes God will shake the tree. But then some people, they look at what they have left and they get discouraged. And what I came to tell you this morning is what you have left is what God allowed to stay. Because I want you to take what you have left and I want you to build with it. So don't be discouraged about what you have. You have what you need to be the man that God has called you to be. You have what you need to do the thing that God has called you to do. I, that was a good point. You ought to clap and shout on it this morning. Come on, somebody. Tell neighbor, you got what you need. But you know what you got to have is you got to have the right mentality. I've learned that a results-driven vision, how many want results? Right? Must must. A, a results, uh, a results driven vision must be led by a particular type of personality. Now, this is where I might get quiet because this is where I think some of our people struggle. But I want you to hear this. I, don't, I think less people struggle in our church. But there was a time when everybody struggled with this, but less people struggle. But some struggle. In order to have results, you got to have the right mentality. Someone say right mentality. Here it is. A results-driven vision is led by an owner and not a renter. What's the difference between an owner and a renter? A renter is a user. When you rent an apartment, you just rent it to use it. You don't care about it. You only do what the contract tells you you're required to do. And whenever something big challenging arises, you don't take it on yourself. You delegate it to who? The owner. <laughs> Let me tell you something, baby. You're not going to be able to delegate the problems of your vision to somebody else. If you want results, you got to move from being a renter to being an owner's mentality. Oh, come on, somebody. I'm preaching better than you're shouting. He's moving you from renter to owner. An owner is not, a, is not a user. An owner is an investor. And for your, will, your vision to work, you've got to be willing to invest. You, you've got to be willing to invest. This is the delineating line between people who, who are successful and not successful. Renters are, are, are users. Owners are investors. The minute you invest, your mentality shifts. The minute you invest, your whole spirit shifts. It's almost like you become a different person. Come on, somebody. When you're driving a rental car, you eat sunflower seeds in the car and spit the seeds on the carpet. 
you drink soda, you do whatever, you know, because that ain't your car. You don't care. But if someone eats in your car, you you get in the flesh. Talk to me, somebody. Because there's a difference between being a renter and being an owner. I got any owners in this place this morning. And for the vision to work, you've got to invest in the vision. The minute you invest is the minute your mindset changes. And understand that it, that shift moves you from seasonal commitment to enduring commitment. Who are the ones who walk in endurance? This is good stuff. Who are the ones that walk in endurance? It's the ones who are invested. I've been experiencing this in my life and in our ministry, in our community. So many doors have been opening up in our community. We were at Rady's last night. Man, one of the best outreaches we've had so in a few, in a, you know, we've been doing it every month. The team goes every month. We had a great outreach last night. We, the police are coming and we're ministering to them. We, we've done so many different things, you know, the different things that we've been experiencing, different doors. We're invited by the mayor next week to go and be with them. Georgina and I will be attending a special gathering with the mayor and his wife. All these things are happening. Why? 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 Because when we came into San Diego, we came in with the right mentality. We didn't come into the city saying, what can the city do for me? We didn't come in with a mentality that says, oh, we're just a bunch of drug addicts and gang members and people coming out of prison and we don't have nothing. Can you help us? We didn't come in with a welfare mentality. We didn't come with an attitude that says, you have to help me. You have to do this. You have to do that. No, we didn't come in with our hand out. We came in with our hand up. We came in with the mentality, watch this, not what can the city do for us. We came in with the spirit that says, what can we do for America's finest city? Could Victory Outreach make San Diego, America's finest city, a little bit better? Come on, somebody. Can we take care of our neighborhood? Can we take care of our community? Can we take care of the people of San Diego? Come on, somebody. So what did we start doing, man? We didn't go in with a renter's mentality. We went in with an owner's mentality. We said, this is our city. This is our community. This is our block. These are our people. And we taught you how... To give. Come on, somebody. And I want to tell you, man, ever since we learned to give, the city can't stop wanting to give to us. Because how many know when you're an owner and you make an investment, you always get a return on your investment? Some of you are not liking this. Some of you like, you're not liking it. That's okay. This message may not be for you. But how many say, I'm receiving this word. I want results in my life. Touch your neighbor and tell them, then you've got to be an owner. Jesus said it, Mark 10, 29, 30. No man leaving houses and anything will not receive from the Lord. 3,600 fold in heaven and also here on earth. So how many know investors always get paid back? Can I hear an amen? So the first thing is you need to value time. And number two, investment. The second way to get results, are you guys with this word? This is key. Results require risk. Results require risk. See, we know that passion is a requirement to see any vision happen. Last week, I remember I was talking about passion. And I, I think passion is an important topic because there's so many passionless people in the house of God. There's a lot of passionless people. They don't sing. They don't shout. They don't say amen. They don't, you know, you have a gathering like we have one on Sunday. They're not going to go because they have no passion to grow. They don't come out to church on Sunday night. They have no passion. They don't go to Bible study. They're, 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 they don't have any passion. Amen? So how many know passion is a requirement for anything to work? But do you know that the joy and excitement of passion is only one level? If, if you want to get results in your life, you should be excited. I think that excited people attract other excited people. I, I told you last week, I, I roll with a certain type. Like, I roll with a certain type. Five Ps, purpose, right? Uh, uh, passion, right? 
uh, perseverance, right? Uh, 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 what was it? Peace, peace. You got to have peace. Don't be all in a crazy spirit around me. Come on. And, 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 then, and then prosperity. So those are the five. Those are why, that's why I roll with. I don't know what your standard is, but that's my standard. So I don't want to be around the dead Christians. If you're dead, don't talk to me. If you come to church and try to turn this service into a funeral, you're going to lose every time. Because this is not a funeral. We got joy in this place, excitement in this place. We got passion in this place. All right? So take your religious body to that dead church. Someone say passion. But there's another level. Someone say another level. And the true evidence of passion is not just jumping and shouting. Because there's a lot of people who can jump and shout. In fact, I got so annoyed with our church jumping and shouting at this altar. I told the ushers, don't let them come up here no more. Because most of the people jumping up here were the ones who weren't willing to risk. They were just acting a fool. I said, Kit, sit those people down. They're driving me nuts. Because there's another level of passion. It's not just jumping and shouting and saying amen. At some point, if you want to get results, you've got to risk something. Oh, my God. You remember a few weeks ago I talked to you about what risk was, you know, risk-taking church? I said a risk is a dangerous investment. It's putting something on the line. It's taking a risk at losing something. And let me tell you who the real winners are. It's not the people who keep everything in their hand and keep everything in their pocket. It's the people that are willing to take it and put it in the hand of God. Come on and clap. I'm preaching good this morning. If you want to go to the next level of passion, you can't just come up here and shout and act all crazy and act all like you're freaking out at the altar. My friend, there's a time for that. But you've got at some point to begin to take what you have left and what God has given you. And you've got to put it back in the hands of God and say, Lord, it's something in my hand, but it's something much greater in your hand. You're able to take it. You're able to multiply it. You're able to grow it. Come on, somebody get excited about what God is saying to you this morning so many people never see results because they're afraid to take a risk and if you want to build how many of you want to build you've got to risk building requires risk what kind of risk risk i found this little poem it says to laugh is to risk appearing the fool to weep is to risk appearing sentimental to reach out for another is to risk involvement. To expose feelings is to risk your true self. Some of you aren't good at that. You put it on Facebook. Uh, I'm having fun. This is a good message. To place your ideas. Watch this. To place your ideas, your dreams before a crowd is to risk the loss of those ideas. To love is to risk not being loved in return. To live is to risk dying. To hope is to risk despair. And to try is to risk failure. But risk must be taken. Because the greatest hazard in life is to risk nothing. The person who risks nothing, does nothing, has nothing, and becomes nothing. They may avoid suffering and sorrow, but they cannot learn, they cannot feel, they cannot change, they cannot grow, they cannot love, they cannot live, and they will never possess what God has for them. Are there any risk takers in this place this morning that say, I'm going to build, I'm going to get results, and I'm going to take a risk? Woo. You got to put it all on the line, my brothers. Jesus told his disciples, you're never going to do anything great hanging out in the shallow water. Oh, my God. There's nothing more embarrassing than to see a 10-year-old child wearing floaties and a life vest. If that were my kid, I wouldn't even go to the pool with them. I would tell his mother, you take him, man. I'm, I'm your mothers, they'll let you. Don't, don't make your men, that, you know, mothers, they'll baby you. You'll be 50 years old sleeping on their couch. 
That's a mom's love, but a dad, boy, get out of here. What's the matter with you? Take off those floaties. Take off that life vest. Pick that kid up. Throw him into the deep. Be a man. Be a man. Be a man. Jesus looked at those disciples and said, get out of the shallow water. Tell your neighbor, get out of the shallow water. There ain't no fish in the shallow water. There's nothing but guppies in the shallow water. We're launching out into the deep. We're going to do more. We're going to get greater results. Come on, somebody. We're going to pull in some nets that are so big that you can't even get them inside of the boat because we are people that know how to trust God and know how to take a risk. Tell your neighbor, take a risk. Created for results. How many want results? Number three, results require teamwork. You've heard it, teamwork makes the dream work, makes the vision work. Chinese proverb is tell me, I'll forget, show me, I may remember, but involve me and I will understand. Come on, somebody. Anything significant in your life, hear me and hear me loudly and hear me clearly. Anything significant in your life cannot be done alone. If you're a loner and you come to church, let me tell you something. Don't stay alone. You'll never get anything done alone. At some point in your walk with God, you've got to trust again. You've got to risk again. You've got to partner again. Well, I've been burned. Guess what, baby? We've all been burned. Well, I've been hurt by church people. Guess what, baby? I've been in Victor Heights for 25 years. You think I haven't been hurt by some of y'all? But I've learned to put my trust in God. I've learned to partner with the right people. Come on, somebody. You've got to get a team around you. Don't come to me with all that stuff about you've been hurt. I, I don't even want to hear it. Everybody's been hurt. Tell you, everybody's been hurt. Right? But if you want to do anything great, you've got to partner. And, and the people you partner in, partner with, they got to be the right people. And, and they got to be the type of people that have an owner's mentality. Because if you partner with the wrong people, if, if you partner with people that have nothing to lose, they'll just start burning all your stuff. Eating all your food out of your fridge. Come on, somebody. Scaring all your real friends away. You ain't saying nothing to me. Cussing out your leaders. Come on, somebody. Get that fool out of your house. So you got to go, Jack. Because before you showed up, I had a good team. Is this too real? Someone say team. The people that you partner with have to buy into the dream and the vision. Why do so many couples argue? Married couples, why do they fight? Especially young married couples. They usually fight because the other person, they don't feel the other person cares enough about what's happening. Right? You know, they start fighting because you, 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 you don't care enough about the kids. I'm over here clothing them, ironing their clothes, wiping their snot. And you're on the couch watching the Chargers lose. Get your re rear end out of. Come on, ladies, I'm trying to help you. Just help your preacher. Help your preacher help you. I'm trying to help you. Get your tail. I don't care. Get you out from underneath that car. Get out of your cave and get over here and buy into these children. I lost all the guys. Oh, you guys turned on me. Y'all turned on me. You're disloyal then. Because for a family to work, everybody's got to buy in. Talk to me. Say amen. amen. Teamwork. Teamwork. Partnership. Togetherness. Oneness of mind. Oneness of heart. Philippians 2.2 2 said, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. 
having the same love, being of one spirit and being of one mind. You need a partner. Look at their spirit. Look at what they love. Look at their mind. I'm trying to help you this morning. Problem is we partner with people that have a different spirit and a different mind and a different opinion. We live in a world where everyone wants to give their opinion. I don't care about everybody's opinion. I just care about the opinion of the people that are partnering with me. Because I'm not on this earth to wander and wonder. I'm on this earth to get results. And I need people around me that have the same mind, the same spirit, the same love, the same heart. Come on, somebody clap on that word. And if you love your spouse, get their mind. Get their heart. If you have a foul spirit, get your spirit right. Repent at this altar. Get right with God. Because it won't work until you do it. Can I hear an amen? Results require teamwork. Everyone say teamwork. teamwork. And the Bible teaches this, is that if you want great results, how many get something out of this word? I'm almost done. You get some? The Bible teaches that if you want results, then you have to include others. You can't do everything by yourself. You can't try to go at it alone. Touch your neighbor and just tell him, partner with me. Because any real vision, watch this, and take it from a man who's built some things. I've built some things. I think you guys know that. I've built a family. I've built ministry, ministries. We're very involved in building. We love to build. My wife loves to build. We're builders. Your pastors are builders. Nothing came to us for free. There are no sugar daddies. We ain't got no sugar daddies. In fact, you know, if there's a sugar daddy, I'm it. I'm the sugar daddy. I'm giving everybody money. I'm sugar daddy. Just call me sugar daddy. I pay for everything. I pay for lunch, breakfast, dinner. I pay for your conference. I pay for retreat. I pay for everything. I'm sugar daddy. I pay, pay these preachers that come in. I'm sugar daddy. They, you see my phone. They call me like crazy because we're builders. I bring in the voices that will build you. We're investors. We're owners. We have a mindset. How many are getting something? But we recognize this is that you can't build by yourself. Any vision that's a big vision at some point is going to become problematic. Any vision at some point is going to become problematic. Vision is not a problem free environment. So if you've given if you if you have a big vision, but you don't have the emotional maturity to understand that there are going to be problems, then you'll never see that vision happen. And when problems come and you find yourself by yourself, what did the scripture say? If one falls down, he, one will, but if he falls down alone, no one is there. And if you have a habit of running everybody out of your life, always fighting with your leader, fighting with everybody. You won't clap on it. I'm just going to tell you the truth. I'm trying to help you build. How many want results in their life? Well, you're a serial confronter. God, those people annoy me. Well, I just keep it real. I'm going to confront that sister. No, no, shut up. Well, I'm going to confront that brother, you know, because the Bible says, no, the Bible says shut up, be humble. No, Pastor Al says shut up, but the Bible says be humble. Let things slide, walk away, take it to God, keep the partnership, keep the friendship, keep the relationship. Don't burn a bridge you might need to cross over on a later day. Understand that you need the man sitting next to you. You need the woman sitting next to you. You need the person sitting behind you. You need your leaders. You need your pastor. You need your friends in the house of God. One mind, one spirit. I'm preaching the house down in this place this morning. Touch someone to tell them I need you. Dude, some of you need to touch that person and tell them you're sorry. I'm 
I'm sorry for always nitpicking you. I'm sorry for always complaining. I'm sorry for being like a drip, a continual drip, like the rain that drips off the roof every single morning after. I'm tired of getting on your nerves. I'm going to change because I want to keep the relationship together. I want to keep the team together. God has given us a big vision. God has given us a big call. And the bigger the vision, the more people you're going to need in your life. That's why you should wear cologne. Do your hair. Put on some nice clothes. Stop looking like a slob in the house of God. Don't dress for the job you had. Dress for the job you want. Because you need people. <laughs> you need people. This is good preaching today, huh, Gina? Good stuff. That's the only amen I care about. You need people because problems are going to rise. And you have to, at some point, make room for people to come in and help you. In Acts 6, a problem arose. The hell on this, women were not being fed. There was only 12 apostles. They couldn't meet every need. There was going to be a church split. They said the church is racist. They don't care about the Hellenists. They don't care about the Greeks. They only care about the Jews. The Jews are getting the food first. The Mexicans are getting the food first. The blacks are getting the food first. What about us white folk? Come on, somebody. <laughs> it's Victor Outreach, you know. We love white people. Amen. You know, <laughs> you know we do. <laughs> All right, right, MTC? White is right. Amen. <laughs> but they had a big problem. Tell your neighbor they had a big problem. Until the apostles prayed and found the solution that we've got to make room and we've got to grow the team. So they said, look for seven men, but don't look for seven jokers. Look for seven men with a good testimony, men above reproach, men that have capacity, men with leadership in them, men that know how to roll. Give us people that are like us. Can I hear an amen? One mind, one spirit, one heart. The Bible says they raised up those men and the ministry didn't split. The ministry exploded. What am I saying to you is that there's room for you. There's room for you. Let's be a team. Can I hear an amen? Give God a big praise. I'm in my last point. Come on, give God a praise. You get something this morning? How many feel like these messages are growing you? As Matthew comes, the final thing, everyone say results. Results require, and this is the main thing. Well, it's all important. But results require, results require commitment and courage. So let's recap here. Number one, results require time and investment. Number two, results require risk. Number three, results require teamwork. But lastly, results require commitment and courage. And I'll tell you why, because vision is popular and then it's unpopular. Let me talk to this side. One day you're hot. One day you're not. <laughs> One day you're the statue. One day you're the pigeon. Tell you never things change. And when things change around you, and even more importantly, when things change in you, and you dig down deep in your heart, you better find some commitment, and you better be able to find some courage. I would not have been to the place I am today if when all hell broke loose in my life, and I was hot, I was hot, I was hot. Woo, I was hot. But when I cooled off, People start talking negative about me and, and coming against me and criticizing me and criticizing my leadership and criticizing my ideas and coming against our church and saying things. I was hot, man, but then I got cold, ice cold. 
If in that season I didn't dig down and find some commitment and find a little bit of courage, I wouldn't be here today. How many agree with that? Because sometimes you're hot and sometimes you're not. Sometimes you feel like a nut. Sometimes you don't. Things will change on you. But you can't let go of that commitment and courage. You see, you've got to know how to walk alone. I kind of feel like with this third wave, I want to talk to you. I worry about you because social media is turning you into spotlight Christians. My generation didn't have social media. We had word of mouth. If something was good, we told people about it. But your generation is the social media generation and I don't want you to let social media turn you into spotlight believers. What's a spotlight believer? They gravitate to where the spotlight is. We have them here. They come around me. Like, hey, Pastor, hey, man. I'm hot right now. I know. Just stay over there, though. Don't be. Where were you when I was cold? You weren't talking to me. You didn't want to talk to me. I'm hot right now, though. I'm hot. I'm heating up. I'm heating up. Pastor, I was heating up, so you want to be around me. But when I was cold, you didn't even know my name. You didn't talk to me at the conference. You didn't talk to me when you saw me at Starbucks. Come on, somebody. I wasn't hot then, but now I'm hot. Now you want to talk to me. It's too real. Because sometimes you think we don't see, but we see, all, we see everything. And we wouldn't have made it unless we had commitment and courage. Get around the people that are still walking when things are cold. You know, look for those, as I close, who are heavily invested in the vision. I want you to know, I could never leave this church. I really couldn't. You would have to jump me, kick me, drag me out of here to get me to leave. I'll tell you why I could never leave this church because I have too much seed in the ground. Too invested. I, I preach too many sermons. I've preached when I was feeling good. I've preached when I was feeling horrible. I preached through losing a child. I preached through cancer. I preached through marital problems. I preached when I was up here, Georgina, you're all smiling, just like you're the devil. Come on, somebody. She's looking at me like, wait till we get home. Come on, somebody. All that stuff you're talking up there. Come on, somebody. I got too much seed in the ground. I could never leave. All right, if I say that, babe, I don't want you to. It's true. She's done the same thing. But you have some people that could leave easy. And you know, I don't give those people my time no more. I really don't. They want counsel. They want to talk to me. I don't even take their phone call. Because they don't stay. In fact, some would even get upset if I gave up. Some of you are mad at me now. This sermon has got you all mad. Because this type of preaching steps all over your toes, your feet, your ankles, your knees, kicks you in the backside. You don't like it. You say, that pastor's mean. No, I'm not. I'm experienced. I know how to make it. I've been through the storm. I've been through the battle. I'm stronger than I've ever been. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. And if you've been through it, you know how to thank God for a sermon like this. come and go, I'll tell you why they come and go because they don't got nothing in the ground. I don't talk to them because when my wife makes dinner and she spent, she gets home at four and she goes to Sprouts and you know if she's going to Sprouts, it's on that night. 
like, I went to Sprouts. I'm like, dang, I better, I better digest what I ate quick. And she goes to Sprouts, she knows she's about to get down. And if she cooks, and I don't eat it, she don't talk to me. That's how I feel here sometimes. I'm cooking and cooking and cooking and cooking, and some of you won't eat. You got your mouth sealed shut. I ain't talking to you no more. I need some people that are invested. Playing games in the house of the Lord. This is your year to get the results that God wants to give you. Come on and clap in this place. Come on and shout in this place. Hey! Lift up your hands all over this place right now. You can move that out of the way. If this is your message and you're ready for results, I want you to come on up to this altar right now. And I want you to internalize this word, this 